You're listening to DraftKings Network. Hi, I'm Ben Stiller from the Academy Awards snub movie, Dodgeball. You know, this election is a lot like Dodgeball. Kamala Harris is the average Joe underdog, and... No, this isn't a time for jokes. You know what? It's way too important. Donald Trump wants to terminate the Constitution. Project 2025 will give him nearly unlimited power. We can't let him get anywhere near the White House. So, vote for Kamala Harris. Yeah, see, that was better. The serious version was much better, right? Paid for by Harris for president. Warning, this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. If you're a smoker or dipper looking to make a change, you really only need one reason to do it. But with Zen Nicotine Pouches, you can find many. Zen is America's number one nicotine pouch. It's made with only six simple ingredients. There are lots of options when it comes to nicotine satisfaction, but there's only one Zen. Learn more about Zen and find your reason to make a change by registering online at Zen.com. Welcome to the Big Sui, presented by DraftKings. Why are you listening to this show? The podcast that seems very similar to the other Dan Lebitard podcast. I'm sorry, I'm not going to apologize for that. <laughs> in fact, the only difference seems to be this imaging. I have been tempted in restaurants just walking past tables to grab somebody's fries that if they're just there. That hasn't happened to you guys? I've done it. And now, here's the marching man to nowhere, fat face, and the habitual liar. Let's get some real expertise in here, some real sports expertise. Rachel uh, Nichols has been covering Stugatz, the important things in sports for a long time. Yep. It sounded like I almost forgot her name there, didn't it? It sounded <laughs> yes, like it Rachel uh, Nichols. <laughs> yep. well, that's because when you first met me, I was not Rachel Nichols. That is correct. That is that is why that just happened. Uh, that she's, is my she's, it was, married name. Yeah, it's 30 I years used ago. To be Rachel Alexander. Yes, uh, when she worked down here in Fort Lauderdale, uh, she covered uh, the NFL for a long time, sideline reporting. She did college football at the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel, the NHL at the Washington Post, the Masters, four tennis grand slams, half a dozen Olympics, uh, more than half a dozen World Series. And she was in the bleachers mm -hmm. when Freddie Freeman hit this home run and uh, she got her own video. So Rachel, uh, put us there and tell us where this ranks in terms of energy that you have felt. This was one of the coolest things I've seen in baseball. It felt an awful lot like exactly what Kirk Gibson did as a huge underdog against the Oakland A's. Uh, what were you thinking, feeling, experiencing as this happened? And thank you for being with us, by the way. Well, I'm, first of all, a lot of people ask me if I took this with a camcorder. Uh, my phone is fine. Thank you. So uh, I'm just saying. Uh, but, yeah, no. So I love sitting in the bleachers at Dodger Stadium. I feel like you and I sit in so many, like, sterile press environments. And so the bleachers at Dodger Stadium, it's a great building. The fans are awesome. And it's a lot of fun to be out there. The problem is that you have to use your phone to get this view. <laughs> because you're far enough away. <laughs> so I always have my phone out if I really want to see what's going on at the plate. And then once it happens, of course, it is an absolute madhouse there. And, and you see at the end of this video why I like being in the bleachers so much. I mean, look at these people. Would you not want to hang out with these people? You want to hang out with those people. Yeah, it's a little different than the antiseptic press environment. Raise your microphone just a little bit right. there. Well, actually, uh, I have another technical question for you. They gave me these headphones, and they did not plug them into anything. That's huh. a good question. That's, yes. that's, a metal arc, that's the Metal Arc way there. <laughs> well, hold on, Dan. I got it. Are okay. they Bluetooth, maybe? <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not certain. Uh, I'm not certain how we do that. I, I've been thinking about the Dodgers and the and the Yankees series. What a terrible job by Aaron Boone. You cannot put Nestor Cortez in in that spot when he hasn't pitched since September. Yeah, against Freddie Freeman and MVP. You can't no, every, do it. Every yes. Yankees fan. And by the way, my husband's a Yankees fan. So he and I went to this game. I'm in all my Dodgers gear. Right. He's in all his Yankees gear. The other people in the bleachers, not so excited to see him. But he was he was a good foreign fan, quote unquote. Right. Um but yeah, no, there was a lot of oh look at that. That's now the I piece that that's an name. adapter. That's yeah, just excellent work by I love this. That is just excellent <laughs> no, work. It's great. It's People great. who are only listening are just like, what the hell? Is but going why can't on you here? put Torres in that situation? He's great for them. He's because a starter. He He's left-handed. He, he hasn't, hasn't pitched. pitched in so long. Right. Yeah. Right? Since right. September. But I mean. The mood of the game there at that point, you have to remember the Yankees have been ahead 
uh, by a little bit, but you know, off and on for much of the game. They were ahead there. It was the top of the tenth. They scored runs. It felt like if you were in the stadium, it felt like, man, I can't believe we're, we're going to lose game one in our own building like this. And so I think some of the explosion of emotion you saw was, of course, it's the first Grand Slam walk-off in World Series history, but it was also the tension that had built up. I have to say, I've been to a ton of World Series, as you mentioned. I've been to all kinds of championships in other sports. It was one of the best of that level of game. I have ever been in any building for, and that's really fun. One of the quiet things about what is happening with Freddie Freeman, he described this earlier in the playoffs, Dugats. He's heavily medicated because <laughs> if this were the regular season, he would not be playing, yes. probably. Right. Yes. He's injured, and among the prop bets before the game, I was looking for a long shot because Freddie Freeman's one of the few hitters in baseball that I never expect him to make an out because he's just such a good hitter. Uh, I took Freddie Freeman at good odds to hit a double in the game because I didn't like the odds on triple and grand slam, which he also had in the game. Right? Yeah. A triple, I come in, get out of here. A triple to me felt more unlikely than a grand slam. He can't run. Like, he's hurt. He, should, he, he wouldn't yeah, but be. But he has the good drug, Stan. Yeah, no, but does. a triple normally requires some sprinting. You're right about that. A home run is just a trot. I, mean. <laughs> I, thought, um, I thought that that game was magical. And was I, so great. I, I thought something else that happened this week and that got buried by everything is the oldest player in the league, LeBron James against Sacramento, not mm-hmm. only going for a triple-double, but getting so hot, and I just can't believe he's doing any of this at this age. I really can't. But getting so hot that he does this, that he's made 10 in a row, or he feels like he's made 10 in a row, and he can't believe that a teammate is out there taking a contested two-pointer instead of just feeding him the ball. Yes. <laughs> Swing, swing. (laughs) He scored 16 points in three minutes. I mean, that's just insane. And he's 100. When is that? When he scored 16 points in three minutes, what is anybody on that team doing not passing the ball to him? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Although, you know, he comes out after the game and he's like, oh, no, no, no. It it wasn't me. It's a team game. It's the Lakers. So he made a big deal about the fact that, you know, we're a team and all this stuff, which is funny coming out. After that, overheard over there. You were. We were making fun of the statue while you were walking in. Oh. I don't know if you saw this. You're in town because uh, very few people have a better relationship in the media that you do with Dwayne Wade. You have covered his story from start to, uh, yep. to finish, and he's. I mean, he is genuinely. You know beyond sports heroic, Mm -hmm. some of the stuff he stands for is heroic and makes him as beloved an athlete as South Florida has ever had, Mm -hmm. Uh, right uh, up there or above Marino. And those are the two at the top of the list. Uh, Alonzo Mourning and all the others have to go into a second tier because those two guys are the most important in South Florida history. Uh, The statue has teeth. I did it not. It has I, a that, lot of teeth. The, yeah, it it's has a lot a, of teeth, actually. And Freddie Freeman's teeth. I was going to say. That's exactly yes. what I was going to say. How, how do you feel about the uh, how it looks here? Does it look to you like Dwayne Wade? I mean, look. I think it looks clearly how Dwayne Wade sees himself. That's how I could. That's what that's I can say answer. about oh, him. Oh shit! That's a well, good no, answer. I, I, that's not a dig. Yes. It's that because he had the most input on this, and in the end, it, it's for him. So uh, he said he visited uh, the statue maker four different times. He said that one of the visits, he told me, he said, "Oh yeah." He says he's like they didn't get the distance between the bottom of my nose and my lip correctly. The ratio was off, so I had the measure in between the bottom of my nose and the lips, they could get that exactly right. So if he's doing that level of detail, it tells me that the rest of it, he was like, oh yeah, this is it. So if this is what he wants and how he sees himself, I'm gonna have Jessica to has been him. swayed. Jessica, I can see on her face that Jessica has been swayed both by your it, the spin room did not help her do it, <laughs> no. but you and I mean, seeing it up close made her feel like it looks more like him now. I mean, it, first of all, if Dwayne Wade is happy with it, I'm happy with it because who am I to judge? If this is how he wanted to be depicted forever, then good. But I'm not gonna lie, and I'm not just saying this. I'm not just saying this, Dan. The more I stare at it the more I am starting to kind of see it. If you just give it a glance, it's not him. But if you, if you stare at it for like 
maybe five or ten minutes. It's just starting to look more like him. This angle that you guys are showing up right now, the head on, straight on, that no one's tall enough to see angle, looks much more like him. It's when you're standing below it, which we all are because none of us are 13 feet tall, you just see the jaw, right? That's all you see. So I think that's part of it too. But Jess, thank you for the backup. Appreciate that. I actually brought a little experiment in here. Wow. So that you guys could see how hard it is to mm. make someone out of bronze. Okay. So I don't know if you are familiar with this photo. Yes, one of the classics. Who are those one guys? The, exactly. Put it on the poll, please, Juju at Levitard Show. Younger. Does Dwayne Wade get to decide whether Dwayne Wade's statue looks like <laughs> looks Dwayne like Wade? Wade. Yes. Yeah. All right. So this is y'all, right? Yeah, that used to be me. Yeah. I fed this <laughs> into <laughs> because we're all chat. We're all AI now, right? So I fed this into ChatGPT, and I was like, "Can you please make a stat bronze statue out of this?" So I don't know if we can go back to it, but here's what the uh, here's what ChatGPT came up with. That doesn't look anything oh, like us. I so mean, much better. the hat. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, they, got the, they got that's, Stugatz's shirt. No. Yeah. This is why we need to fund the arts. Is that what right? Yes. Yeah. And They're facing they, the same direction also <laughs> as the other picture. Look how tall you got. Look how tall you got. Yeah. All right. So then I was like, well, that's not wow. quite right. Right. So let's let's try again. Right. Ooh. So then I was like, okay, do a second one. Oh, there we go. There okay. it that's is. Like, then, that's in the 1920s. Yes. Like that. There you go. Yeah. Again, Users. you've grown. <laughs> Yep. And then I was like, all right, this isn't working, so I'm going to try Photoshop. What can Photoshop do? And that's what you guys got. <laughs> okay. Yes, that's In not great either. Photoshop. I see it there. I see and I, and I want to I wanna show you your face here, Dan. There. <laughs> Good. So, Grizzly, haunting. Yes, so, a bit, a shade of demonic. Right. So if this was your statue, what would people be saying about your face? Yeah, it wouldn't be good. Uh, <laughs> it, would be, it would be fiery depths of hell type stuff. Hey everyone, it's Mike Ryan. You hear that? That is the sound of me cracking open an ice-cold Miller Lite. Maybe, if you're the lucky winner of the DraftKings Weekend Observation presented by Miller Lite Prediction Pool, you and a friend can come crack one open with me and the rest of the Dan Lebitard Show with Sue Gatz. All you have to do is go to DraftKings and predict what will happen during a segment Weekend Observations presented by Miller Lite on October 29th. How long will the segment last? What hour will it air in? Who will be in the shipping container feeding Sugats' lines? So many variables. And only one winner. Well, one winner and their guest. So two people, but one winner. But we're all winners when it comes down to it, right? Especially when you have an ice-cold Miller Lite in your hand. Must be 21 plus to enter. Eligibility restrictions apply. Void where prohibited. See DraftKings.com for details. Don Lebatard. We got Afrini Hardaway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Freedy? <laughs> Who was a Freedy Hardaway? I was trying to read fast. UD was on the team. Luke Jackson. Bobby Jones. Who the Matrix, Sean Marion. Stugatz. <laughs> Zoe, Shaq, Smush Parker. Chris Quinn. Wait a minute. D Wade. Wait a minute. Jason Williams, they're all right. I mean, stacked roster. This is the Don Lebatar Show with the Stugatz. Speaking of Stugat, uh, you said you're, you used to look like that. Um, I don't know whether you saw some of the commentary as you released your Stugat's picks for the weekend. No, I didn't. Uh, uh, I know I'm on fire. That's what I know. Uh, and you're all welcome. I mean. Uh, uh, woof, he's never looked worse. Does Metal Lark have health care or what? <laughs> he's, he's got five years left at best. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. I'll take it. <laughs> Can someone please set Stugat's up with a different camera and lighting that doesn't make him look like a bridge troll uh, gremlin? Mm. Wow. Did, it, did that from home. Uh, thank you, everyone. Appreciate yeah, seriously. It. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> Dwayne Wade's statue is looking pretty good compared to that commentary. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think so. I think the internet was making some good fun of Dwayne Wade's stature. I think, uh, don't you agree, Stugatz, that Rachel and Jeremy are the only two people defending this today? Yeah, it's an odd thing to defend. It looks no, nothing no, no, like no, it. No, I mean, I'm not defending the statue. I'm just saying that Dwayne likes the statue. And so, as Jess notes, there's a point where I have to say, it's his statue. He had a huge hand in it. In fact, he had the biggest hand in it of anyone. So at some point, who am I to say, oh, that's not good enough for you? But there is a moment before every statue unveiling where you imagine like the worst case scenario. Oh, yeah. And I, I imagine <laughs> everyone at the statue in uh, unveiling was thinking, oh, what if this is terrible? And then mm -hmm. you see it and you're like, hmm. Mm. 
<laughs> yeah, polite golf polite applause pl- is what you get. <laughs> did you uh, did you have any uh, thoughts on? Uh, and I'm going to get serious here sure. uh, for a second. Uh, yep. I don't know. I've been wanting to talk about this since the weekend. I understand, Stugatz, that the newspaper endorsement is not something that matters anymore in the modern age. Nobody cares anymore. It would appear about journalism and its need to, uh, to call truth to power. But at the L.A. Times and the Washington Post, there have been two things that have been deeply unseemly where we've always separated the money from editorial. And now Mm -hmm. editors are resigning because the rich people at the very top of the newspaper chain, the people who own the L.A. Times and Bezos, who has all the F.U. money in the world and is still scared of Trump, all the F.U. money in the world and they never say F.U. Now you've got the fairly unprecedented in the modern age situation where the LA Times and the Washington Post are not putting out endorsements because they've got billionaire owners who are handling the truth for what are supposed to be objective newspapers who give you these endorsements based on a vetting of the facts. They're not just sloppy endorsements because your paper has liberal politics. It's supposed to be a vetting of the facts at a time that it's more obvious than ever that it is time to choose sides The rich people with the FU money are strangling their editorial departments and making their editors resign because there's not a separation of the money and the content as there has been in our 30 years in this business. Yep, yep. But to me, it's it's even less about this particular endorsement in either of these cases because, as you point out, honestly, if they had just endorsed the way they normally do, no one would have paid attention. So, so there's something to be said of how much does it really matter. What it's really about to me is you have a presidential candidate who is openly threatening to go after the people and institutions who, in a democratic process, decided, huh, of these two candidates in a, what is supposed to be a free and open election, if you support the other one and I get elected— I will come after you. And there's precedent for this when he was president last time, that there were businesses, uh, media organizations he didn't like, and he sort of made things more difficult. I know there was an incident with CNN where he was trying to do something to Time Warner and all of that stuff. So I think that what this speaks to is less about an endorsement or not an endorsement. It's about, hey, this looming idea of the country is going to change drastically, and I don't mean the flavor or mood of the country, I mean what we have built this country on. He is specifically saying, I would like to change this drastically, and people can decide if they want that or not, but for those of us who like a free press, who like the the Bill of Rights, who like the Constitution, and we say, huh, we are already seeing before the election even happens, we are already seeing this start to go away, that is terrifying. And it's not even political over which candidate you like. If you like this country, if you like the United States, and you like the fact that we have freedom of speech, and you like the fact that we have free elections, and you like the fact that you can print or put out a newspaper that says anything pretty much you want, that is already going away before the election even happens? That is a harbinger of something much bigger and scarier, and I think that's why it struck a chord with so many people. You and I care about the journalism. We have to be honest. Most people could give a crap about the journalism, but they do care about the fact, and this has touched such a chord with so many people, because it is about, is this country going to fundamentally change? Is democracy going to fundamentally start to go away in this country in a way that we just haven't seen in, you know, 200 something years? I do think Washington Post subscribers do really care about it or else they wouldn't be spending their money on the subscription. And there has been a huge backlash from a lot of people either canceling subscriptions from employees of the Post who are like really upset about this decision and from people like writing letters to the editor and just like voicing their disdain for what is obviously a like unconscionable choice this close to the election um so while like the maybe the vast majority of people are like yeah this doesn't affect me like why would a newspaper choose a candidate anyways i don't really understand why this happens um i do think among the people that do care this is like a huge betrayal of trust and so i i don't know how they're like as a 
as a company, as a brand, as like a trusted institution, I don't know how you sort of recover from that. Well, I think, again, that's symbolic, though, of a bigger thing, right? I, I think that even the subscribers of the Washington Post who are canceling their subscriptions, I don't know how many of them would have actually leafed to page three and read that editorial. I think it's more about what does the Washington Post stand for? I worked at the Washington Post for almost 10 years. And one of the things that you are most proud of when you walked in the door is this is an organization that speaks truth to power, right? This is the organization. This is a newspaper that, that brought down Nixon with Watergate. This is the newspaper that published the Pentagon Papers when the government was threatening, we will shut you down if you publish classified information and, of course, sued them and all of that stuff. And the idea that this organization would crumble in the face of something that really is feels he's not even benign, at benign, the moment. benign, benign. Like this is cowardice of the highest order that you would have Bezos money and you would run scared from Trump when you own the Washington Post. And all you're doing is the most basic of journalism. It's not even the hard journalism. No. Like that's not that's, that's not, not the, the that's not papers. that's not what that's the not Washington Watergate. Post is built on. And endorsement is nothing. It's exactly. like it's the flimsiest thing your newspaper can do. Yeah, but journalism can be bought, and Bezos owns that newspaper, and Bezos wants out there what he wants out there. And so I know it hurts you guys because journalism has been dying a slow death and continues to die. Thanks for bringing that up. I appreciate uh, that. I mean, I'm sorry. It's just mm -hmm. the reality that we're in. But he bought the Washington Post, and he wants – I don't agree with it, but he wants to put out the message he wants to Understood, put out there. Understood, but he had uh, stayed out of these things, and now he's not staying out of these things reportedly. I want to read yeah. something to you from Caroline Kitchener, who works for the That's, Washington it's Post. It's so funny. I was just going to bring this up, so please read it, Deborah. So she says, my mom just told me she canceled her subscription to the Washington Post. She reads every one of my stories. It was a heartbreaking call. I understand why she did it, but I asked her to reconsider. To anyone who has canceled or is thinking about canceling, here's what I said. Post reporters had no part in this decision, but when you cancel, you're hurting us, not our owner. I feel lucky to work at a place that doesn't tell uh, when I need... Uh, I'm sorry that I, I've got this here uh, wrong in the wrong place. Uh, I feel lucky to work at a place that doesn't blink when I say I need to fly to Texas to meet a woman whose life has been changed by an abortion ban to document the impacts of Dobbs up close. I can only do that if we have subscribers who support us. Reporters in the Post newsroom will continue to do our jobs. We will report fearlessly on whoever becomes president and so many other things that really matter because we are independent and care deeply about holding the powerful to account. I completely understand if you've lost faith in our owner, but please don't lose faith in us. It's just a weird time for Bezos to make his only appearance as someone who's power brokering here. And I, I just think that that's such an important message from the reporter. And I've heard that from my reporter friends at the LA Times and now at the Washington Post. It's like, wait, 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 wait. You're, you're hurting the wrong people, uh, especially with Bezos, especially with the Washington Post. Are you brave enough to cancel your Prime subscription? Because that's where you're going to hurt him. Is is your Amazon use going to go down? Is your Prime subscription? I mean, Thursday going away? night football. I mean, no, well, but all of that, right? And so, if you really want to put your money where your mouth is, Jets, uh, Jets, uh, Jets, and Texans look, coming up on Thursday. You might yeah, be better off cancel. not watching that game. Nervous, actually, yeah. <laughs> you might want to cancel. You might, say it's in protest of this decision, but by the time Thursday comes around, yourself. I will have talked myself into the Jets <laughs> can still win the AFC. Oh East. my yeah, lord! I will. Um, but right, so that's that's actually if you really want to hurt Jeff Bezos, that's the choice that actually would affect his bottom line, don't hurt the reporters. It's a heartbreaking to see. I think it's a good time to, to celebrate and, and give proper attention to the billionaires that aren't afraid of endorsing a political candidate. Take Rupert Murdoch, for example. There is a courageous billionaire right there that is not afraid to use his media entities to make a point. What were the highlights from last night, Rachel, and the Dwayne Wade ceremony uh, <laughs> beyond everyone making fun of the statue? Your left turns are one of my favorite things. About well, Jessica to the wanted show. to get in here with something related to this I conversation, and I cut her off. <laughs> did someone say left turns? Did anyone watch what Tyler Reddick did on the final oh lap? Oh my God! No. Blaney <laughs> left the top open, and Tyler Reddick, who at one point led this led this race by 23 seconds, all of a sudden had to climb back into it after an ill time bit, and then he makes home at his home yet again 23 xi into the final four you know what never mind go ahead rachel <laughs> tell us about the statue unveiling <laughs> it was a lovely moment obviously you know look as you point out Dwayne is so beloved here and the en energy in front of the building with all the fans who came by was so cool to see and the idea that as he put it he went when he was in Chicago growing up that, you know, he's, he's like, we didn't have the Internet. Right. So I didn't know that statue of George was down there. 
he said, and the first time I got to go to the arena and saw that there was a statue of my hero, Michael Jordan, I couldn't believe it. He told me, he's like, I thought statues were only for sort of old Greek people and presidents. He's like, I didn't know they made statues for athletes. So to see something I did, basketball, could result in a statue of you, he said, was such an eye-opening moment. And the idea that some kid could come up and see his statue and feel that way and sort of imagine what is possible. I think that stuff has incredible power. As someone who has covered him since the beginning, you know Mm -hmm. just how improbable the odds are of someone who has shared the most vulnerable parts of his story with Mm us. There is no amount of odds that can be overcome in sports larger than Dwayne Wade coming from what he came from to statue outside of the arena, given that his childhood is filled uh, with no maps. It's got a lot of crud in it that that is hard to get out of. Yeah. And and just any one of those things that we've talked about about him could have felt him. Right. I mean, we've seen athletes taken down by all kinds of not only sort of environments and oh he grew up around guns or he grew up around the wrong people and he's got them around him now to just the mental toll it takes on you to figure out how to get out of that situation ron artest said something to me once he we were doing a story on him and i was living in new york and we were talking about where he grew up in queensbridge and he's like Oh, yeah. When I was a little kid, we used to duck at the gunshots across the projects. But, you know, by the time you're 10 or 11, you you just kind of stop ducking because, like, you can't you're bigger and you can't hit the ground that much anymore. And so he goes, you just kind of go through from 10 to 18, hoping that as you walk through and you hear gunshots, one of them doesn't hit you. If you grow up like that. You cannot imagine what it is like to grow up any other way. And those of us who didn't can't really fully picture that. And the fact that Ron Artest struggled with his mental health throughout of his career is in some part, and he has talked about this extensively, that he learned from therapy in some part. It's because of what he grew up with. Dwayne was able to manage all of that stuff. And that is remarkable. And frankly, as much worth a statue to me as what he did on the court. So why did P.J. Tucker get one? Ooh. I mean, you know, the shoes. <laughs> the shoes. <laughs> I've seen Keith Bogans, Antoine Walker, and P.J. Tucker all resemble this statue more than the person you were just waxing poetic it, it about. Means, <laughs> it does mean something, though, Rachel. You're here because you're celebrating a an epic career from start to finish, mm-hmm. one that does a heroic work after playing as well. Like, mm-hmm. you're, you're flying across the country because... Yes. 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 Look, the, the the way he has been a dad is something that obviously has been the biggest part of his post-playing career. He wrote a book on it. He's gone on the Today Show about it. It's not it, it's twofold. Obviously, we talk a lot about Zaya, the support he's given her, the example he has been to so many other dads and parents of how do you go through this, how you can be proud of your daughter in these kinds of moments, which I think there wasn't really an example of. So I think that has been tremendous. But just as a dad and this entire generation of NBA players sort of decided, and it was Chris Paul, and it was Dwayne, and it was LeBron, and it was Melo, we want to be different public dads than the generation before us in basketball. And remember what we heard about those guys all the time. It was, oh, he's got 16 kids by 13 women, or oh, can he even name all his children, or all of that stuff they came out and said no 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 here's my son at the press conference I am a dad see me as a father and that sort of redefinition of black fatherhood was an actual talking point for them it was something they discussed and wanted to put out there during their playing careers and I think that is amazing that they really showed a generation no you can put this forward. You don't have to be ashamed of this. This is something that you should you should not only strive for, but that you should put right up front. And I think all of that stuff is what makes people so drawn to him and why, for me, covering him throughout his entire career, literally from the day he was, you know, stepped on an NBA court and really before that at Marquette to now has been, it's just been fascinating to watch. Most guys don't have that kind of impact in any sense. The odds are totally against everything that we just witnessed here. And Dwayne Wade seems hell-bent on having a bigger, more impactful uh, post career than he did basketball career. I, I would say that you will see him more on national television than you ever have before coming up in the next few years because there's a lot of these new NBA broadcast partners bidding for his services. And so if he decides to, 
I think you will you will see even more Dwayne Wade in a lot more areas. He seems to want to get good at that stuff, yeah. and if he wants to get good at something, we've seen the will that gets applied to that. Like it it does it doesn't Could seem to be making that. statues. Yeah. Yeah, to make it, we were all like tripping over each other. Should have applied it to statue making. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ben Stiller from the Academy Awards snub movie, Dodgeball. You know, this election is a lot like Dodgeball. Kamala Harris is the average Joe underdog, and... (sighs) No, this isn't a time for jokes. You know what? It's way too important. Donald Trump wants to terminate the Constitution. Project 2025 will give him nearly unlimited power. We can't let him get anywhere near the White House. So, vote for Kamala Harris. Yeah, see, that was better. The serious version was much better, right? Paid for by Harris for president. This episode is brought to you by Allstate. Some people just know they could save hundreds on car insurance by checking Allstate first. Like, you know to check you have the tickets in your wallet first before you drive two hours to the big game. Seriously, you had one job. Now the closest you'll get to the 50-yard line is parking lot D. Yeah, checking first is smart. So check Allstate first for a quote that could save you hundreds. You're in good hands with Allstate. Savings vary. Terms apply. Allstate Fire and Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Northbrook, Illinois. Don Lebatard. Let's go to uh, 80. His Bo. name is Bo. <laughs> wow. I think Billy typed uh, an 8 instead of a B. Fine. It's the clearest day. <laughs> <by> <laughs> right. Two dollars. Stugatz. Number 80. Oh, <laughs> it's Chris Corner on the line. CC. This is the Don Lebatard show with the Stugatz. Los Angeles sports teams, Stugatz, are undefeated since Thursday. The Rams over the Vikings, the Kings over the Sharks, the Dodgers over the Yankees twice, Lakers over the Suns, USC over Rutgers, Lakers over the Kings, Clippers over the Nuggets, Kings over Utah, Galaxy over Rapids, USC over Gonzaga, Chargers over Saints, Clippers over Warriors, and LAFC over Whitecaps. That's Mm. uh, an entire weekend of winning, and uh, Rachel Nichols works in Los Angeles, and the thing that I wanted to ask ask her about you went sacramento so you said all of california i'm guessing did uh, not lose this week okay yeah Northern my bad california. all of los yeah. angeles yes. is what i meant thank you, uh, <laughs> you got it. for the correction important uh, one yeah. uh jj reddick how is that going as the coach of the lakers it's uh, it's actually on the court it's going great and, and jj of course is like got 10 years of ideas it, it's sort of like a guy with his first novel or first movie you can see all the 10 years sort of building up in, in the beginning of this season the players love him and have really responded to him so that's all great we see the the little things that he's still learning how to be a coach and that stuff will obviously fix itself but but just like little funny things so after the first game, he's complaining about the basketballs. He's like, I'm going to send, I'm going to write into the NBA tomorrow. I'm going to tell them we can't be playing with new basketballs. Anyone who's been a shooter, you know, you have to have worn in basketballs. And, and people sort of laughed and he goes, I'm not joking. You guys know me. I'm not joking. Like, this is a problem. And, and I'm kind of, you know, neurotic about this stuff. And then someone clearly had to explain to him that the team provides the basketballs. So someone in his own organization was the one who was like, oh, it's a new season. Here's some new basketballs. So he comes out the next day and he's like, oh, you know, I was just joking around. And I'm like, but you said you weren't joking. Um, but that's the kind of <laughs> that's the kind of thing where, I mean, even his first press conference, he, he curses during his first press conference for emphasis. And then someone has to tell him, you know, you're on the local radio and TV with the children listening at three o'clock in the afternoon. We, we can't do that. So just little things. There was a story yesterday about how he's watching game film at a car wash. He was at a car wash around the LA area. Baron Davis, who also lives right around there, saw him at the car wash and saw him watching his laptop and game film and I think part of that is you know the story is told he's so dedicated Dan he's watching film at the car wash Mm. and that is true however also it is learning that as an NBA coach you can't spend three days getting ready for a game that happens that night it, it, it all comes at you kind of fast. So I think he's learning all that stuff. Um, apparently, if you at your car wash want to start looking at game film of how things could improve with the headphone situation here, then maybe that could that be That was embarrassing. Good. I, yeah, I, on yeah. my hands and knees yeah. next to you trying to figure I, out how I, to I work the to headphones. Help. Uh, mm-hmm. Are you surprised that JJ goes to the car wash? Because for me, he comes off as a guy that has the car wash come to him, you know? I mean, right. you know, maybe he's, he's out of the house too often, too early. I don't know. I don't hmm. know. It's a good point, though. Uh, yeah. uh, Stugatz 
Pats at Lebitard show. Uh, Juju put it on the poll. Does JJ Reddick look like somebody who goes to the car <laughs> wash right. or has the car wash come, come to, to him? him. Uh, what do you make of uh, Stephen A. Smith calling Kawhi Leonard the worst superstar in the history of sports when you juxtapose that against uh, Kawhi's trainer last week suing the organization for, if not malpractice, malfeasance? Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's Kawhi is a mystery wrapped. What's the mystery wrapped in an enigma? Wrapped in a riddle? Wrapped in a whatever? Something like I that. I don't know what's going on a with cannoli, him. A cannoli, yes. Cannoli, exactly. Mm, nailed it. I don't know what's going on with him. Do you know what's going on with him? I don't, but I find interesting the appraisal that takes him out as if he doesn't care when I don't think that's what's going oh, on I with don't him. Think I don't he doesn't I, but care. I, but I think if you say that someone is load management, if he's yeah. ground zero of load management yes. and he's ground zero of players don't care that much, mm -hmm. uh, I believe hitting him with that person is careless is probably an appraisal I'm willing to reject. Nobody who, who has spent this many years trying to get back from various injuries doesn't care. Because guess what? He has all the money. So if he didn't care, he would have a perfect out to say, you know what? My body's just too broken. I've been trying for years. I'm out. I'm going to go you know, play with my toy trains or whatever it is that he spends his money on. But instead, he keeps doing this. So look, you can think a lot of things about how he manages his body, but doesn't care to me is, is not really on the table. The thing with Kawhi Leonard you have to remember is he load managed his way to an NBA title. And I don't just mean during that season with the Raptors where he did sort of this, oh, I'm not going to play in this game. I'm not going to play in that game. During the NBA Finals. During games, he would load manage the games. So for three quarters, he would just be sort of on the court doing some things. And then in the fourth quarter, he would play. So if you're a guy who has managed to get it down to that much of a science that you can load manage minutes within a game, of course you're going to be doing this during the season. And I think he's just doing it all to extend his career so he can play as opposed to the opposite. Can you give us some insight into how the Jimmy Butler story is going to end in Miami? No, I mean, I, I I am very eager, along with the rest of Heat Nation and everyone else, to see how both sides play this out this year, right? Because I thought it was smart of the organization not to extend him. I think that he has to decide if he's all in with this team or not. If he is, I have a feeling, and you've watched this team much more up close than I have, that they're going to figure out a way to work it out. Or if if by the middle of the season it's just not working anymore, then maybe they decide, okay, let's trade him and see who's interested. He's 35 years old, and he's never been a three-point shooter in the way that the NBA is going right now. And you have to sort of take stock and say, okay, do we want him here because of the heart and soul that he gives to the team, and therefore it's worth us paying him, but not as much as he wants? Or do we say, okay, it's time for a new era in the Heat? Why are the Celtics so disrespected? A team that won a championship, did so in pretty dominating fashion, and yet no one takes them seriously. It's weird. Yeah, it, I find this completely bonkers. I mean, look at how many times this team has been in the NBA Finals just in the last five years. Right. Look at what these guys have accomplished. They're still so young, mm -hmm. right? It's ridiculous. Yes. Do you think it's just anti-Boston hate? Mike, do you hate Boston? Me? No. no. Don't know where you would get that <laughs> from. <laughs> Circling back uh, to a, a franchise that has won more championships in my lifetime than Miami Heat. Yeah. Historically, for Jimmy Butler, when he breaks up with a place, it, it usually ends ugly. Yeah. Um, do you think he's at a different place in his life now where this could at least be uh, a little bit, uh, well, less like the, the previous stops, or will this be headed to Ugly Town? I know that he didn't speak to the media one day already. He showed up late to media day. Right. This seems like it could head in that direction. It could, for sure. Look, Minnesota was ugly, right? I think Chicago was more just they didn't want him anymore. I mean, that was crazy to me about Chicago. They were like, ah, we, we want to see what we can get for him. And it was because we don't want to pay him. And then it was like, oh, wait, you're drafting to hope you can maybe get a Jimmy Butler. And then, of course, they never have. I, It could get ugly because obviously nobody likes it when someone says, actually, we don't love you as much as you thought we did. I mean, that's kind of what the, he did to him, right? And told him to shut up. Right. They were like, oh, no, 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 you don't get flowers and chocolates from us. Sorry, we don't like you that much. Like, that kind of thing. So, I don't know. Stu Gatz, what was your worst rejection by a girl? Oh, wow. Janelle Giagu back in high school. Yeah, it was a tough one. We still haven't yeah. forgiven her. Yeah. No. Yeah, it was tough. Yeah. <laughs> in his so that's, you know. Yeah.
first game as a... Thank you for bringing it up, though. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm just saying that that's sort of what's going on now. the first week now. since then. I haven't thought about it. And we'll, here we are. We'll right? you, thought, you, you were just beginning to heal, and you just reopened that wound. You're you, welcome. You're just, welcome, America. <laughs> Thank you very much. And by the way, I wanted to say one more thing. I know how frustrating it is to be the fan of the team that has Kawhi Leonard. I'm not making an excuse for that and that experience. I'm just saying I don't think you can say he doesn't care. I just assume that his body has betrayed him, and yep. it must be very frustrating in that sport to have your body betray you. But I want to know what your analysis is of Clay Thompson gets to the Mavs, immediately sets a record for threes in a game with six of them mm -hmm. as a Mav, uh, and then Buddy Heald with the Warriors sets a record with the Warriors making 12 threes in two games. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, your thoughts in That's general. That's too many, Dan. Uh, yeah. It's too many threes. <laughs> I mean, he's just Scotty at that point. It's just too it's many. kind of tacky. Yeah. It means right? you're shooting a lot of them. Right. right. And uh, I, I saw Nick Wright kind of pick up on this. We've, we've been talking about this, that there needs to be an evolution. Even baseball got around to, we have to change the rules because we're losing folks. So what do you, you want a four-point line? What do you want? I Ooh. think we should make the courts a little bit bigger. Huh. I, I think that that might just naturally change some things, but I think that the NBA... Do you understand how an arena is built? Yeah, yeah, with the courtside seats. I, I understand. Okay, they can, they can maybe reconfigure. <laughs> but the three has become too easy. That's your point? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I, 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 I think that the athletes have outgrown the, the courts. I think it's... It kind of absurd. That what do you so think? I think, I think that's true in hockey. Actually, no lie. I do think that that uh, ice rink has it's, to get It's in all of the sports. Football yeah. too. What if you no. take out some of the middle of the court and add it on the outsides? Yeah, smart. Mm. Yeah. And look, they smart. need to come it's up with smart. how they're going to replace this by making a bigger court. Like they, that's their job. <laughs> He's like, I don't have an engineering degree, what, people. What if you I'm make just threes? I'm proposing something ridiculous. What if you make threes worth two and you make twos worth three? Huh? What <laughs> mid-range jumpers? What's no, the, the art, now. The, the art of playing in the paint. I mean, the low I know where this game. segment's gonna go, and it's yeah. just gonna be us putting pawns in the middle of a of no, no, no. <laughs> what if you do like an LED strip on the three-point line, Ooh. and at different points in time, it changes color, wow. and it's worth different points? Wow. Or traffic cones. You could put traffic cones Ooh. that guys had to get around. I like right? that. We do like yeah. the yeah. thing yeah. that they do in the All-Star game with the Starry yeah. sponsored mm -hmm. spot. That's worth four points. Mm -hmm. yeah. We do that for the regular. Me and my cousin George, we used to have dunk contests in our grandparents' backyard where we jump over things to dunk. So what if you jump over things to dunk and then it's worth more points? Like, like it. Yeah. yeah. Like George. Like you know? a Kia. Actually, Very good. That's mm. a good callback. Rachel's guess. pretty plugged in. I was actually curious if she's heard any good yeah. solutions. Same. Mm -hmm. or, if mm -hmm. the, or if the NBA itself kind of feels a pressure to actually do something. No, because fans love scoring. I mean, we've seen this in football too, right? Where you can't touch the quarterback. Fans love scoring. And so fans eat this stuff up. And if it gets to the point where fans don't like how the game is going, they'll just change the rules and they'll be like, oh, now we can bring hand checking back. Well, this is what's happening hand right now is well. I'm asking her about the Mavs and the Warriors and you guys are extending the court and taking away all of their prime courtside seats that are worth a lot of money. And yeah. there's no, those are the last seats yes, that are going to be gonna moved. Go. I'm just trying to bring back the low post game. That's exactly. all, I'm That's about all I want to do. Dan's like, all I want to do is talk basketball and you with your nonsense. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Stugatz doesn't have a terrible idea, though, if you're going to change it. I mean, it is a terrible idea. But make the threes worth two and the twos worth three. You don't have to take away the courtside seats. You, right. can, yes. you can allow <laughs> Everything stays the same. Except Think about the, how many threes points. you'd have then, though. 100%. The that's right. The closer you are, then what are free throws worth? The same? What The closer you are to the basket. I think you should have an option on free throws. You should be able to take it from the charity stripe, go a step back, it's worth two, go to the three point line it's worth three how about that huh? you yell bank it's worth four. Oh! but just... in all this talk about changing the rules <laughs> the nba is experimenting with the g league and one of the yeah. the crazy thoughts that they're coming up with is uh, you don't if you get fouled on the three-point shot you don't go to the free throw line and shoot three shots you shoot one for the value of the shot that you attempted so you get one free throw that's worth two points one free throw that's worth three points and mm. that maybe speeds up the game a little bit huh. too interesting i don't know man I, I i want the differentiation because when say you're in an overtime situation or something really crucial at the you're end right. of the game yes how many free throws of the time allotted can he make oh he only made one if he had made that second free throw i don't know i don't love that rule. I do think with Clay, not that you might want to get back to what you asked me. Oh. One of the things I love that he said is that he said, I just needed a fresh start. I needed a change. And part of the reporting was, oh, he's going to go to the Lakers. His dad played for the Lakers. You know, he grew up, he still lives, has a house in LA, all that stuff. And he was like, he thought the Lakers were too much like the Warriors. 
I didn't know what your take was yeah. on that. Yeah, right. <laughs> what if you, instead of shooting three shots, you shoot until you miss if you get fouled on a three? Wow. Ooh, wow. Mm. Wow. Steph set the I was going to say, Steph, line <laughs> Larry Bird would never leave. It's I mean. too bad Steph got hurt last night. <laughs> Why are you wasting this woman's time? <laughs> hey, everyone. It's Mike Ryan. So I'm hearing that you still haven't entered the DraftKings Weekend Observation presented by Miller Lite Prediction Pool. Let me ask you, what exactly are you waiting for? You don't want to guess how many times two gods might swear in the segment? There are so many things that are on the table for you to play along with us. Just go to DraftKings.com and make your prediction, and then listen to the Weekend Observations presented by Miller Lite on October 29th. And check your scores. You and a friend can win a trip to Miami to hang out with us at Playing Again's for a Thursday night football watch party on November 21st. And also, you get to see a taping of the show, and you get to see firsthand what the shipping container may smell like. So, don't wait anymore. Just come on down and enter this contest at DraftKings.com. Play for a free shot to win. Thanks to our friends at Miller Lite. Must be 21 plus to enter. Eligibility restrictions apply. Void where prohibited. See DraftKings.com for details. This is an ad by BetterHelp Online Therapy. October is the season for wearing masks and costumes, but some of us feel like we wear a mask and hide more often than we want to. At work, in social settings, around our family. Therapy can help you learn to accept all parts of yourself so you can stop hiding and take off the mask. Because masks should be for Halloween fun, not for your emotions. Therapy is a great tool for facing your fears and finding ways to overcome them. If you're thinking of starting therapy but you're afraid of what you might uncover, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Take off the mask with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P.com.